Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We're coming to you live tonight after a few weeks of pre-recorded episodes. There has been a lot that has happened since we've recorded live. And I apologize that my voice may be a little bit um, low tonight. I am recovering from COVID. Uh, and it's just funny because Adam and I were talking before the show. And it was basically a year when he was also recovering from COVID uh, almost to the day. So. Mm-hmm. I'm feeling much better, um, but uh, even, um, you know, having four vaccinations shots uh, still caught it. Um, Fortunately, I didn't get too sick, but um, yeah, it wasn't a fun, wasn't a fun thing. So I would highly recommend getting your vaccinations if you haven't, uh, even with those, it, it was Probably the sickest I've been in a long, long time. We were comparing notes before the show, and uh, we had a very similar experience, it sounded like, in a lot of ways. I'm glad you're feeling better and, and can certainly relate to everything you went through. And even one more bit of irony. So when I recorded the show, Recovering from COVID, it was November 14th of last year. And guess what the subject of that show was? Microsoft Ignite, which... I believe we're going to touch on a little bit tonight as well. So even more random coincidence uh, as well, but looking forward to tonight's conversation. Yes, we are going to talk a little bit about ignite. We're going to talk about some new features. This show tonight will be mostly focused around Microsoft things. We are going to start off with a little bit of bad news because this happened on one of the weeks that we have not recorded live, which was there were a few things that, um, that were concerning uh, regarding Microsoft. So there was a data privacy incident that was most recent that happened last week. So news and social media. um, And I was actually on vacation when this happened. So Adam, you were in the trenches Mm -hmm. when this started to hit. And I know that there was some chatter among our group and uh, customers were probably pinging you about it. But Mm -hmm. news and social media started reporting that there was a uh, security incident um, on Wednesday, October 19th. And it turns out that some security researchers at a place called SOC Radar informed Microsoft on September 24th of 2022 this year that there was a misconfigured Microsoft endpoint. And this misconfiguration resulted in potential unauthenticated access to some business transaction data, which corresponded to some interactions between Microsoft prospective customers and some partners um, about planning or implementation of Microsoft services. So once Microsoft was notified of the misconfiguration, the endpoint was quickly secured and now it requires authentication to get to. And Microsoft said that there was no indication that customer accounts or systems were compromised and any affected customers were notified directly. SOC Radar actually had a search tool up for a little bit where customers or partners could look to see if their data was part of it, but it has since been taken down. Uh, Honestly, I think that was probably for the best because if there was a tool that's publicly accessible, then, you know, attackers could use it as well. So, I mean, it's, it's a privacy uh, it's, it's, I mean, like, honestly, to try, to try to protect the privacy of everyone involved, it's better that it's not publicly accessible. So, um, but yeah, I mean, this was uh, pretty big news. Um, I can't remember the last time something like this happened. And so uh, I know that there were a lot of people who were concerned that reached out. And um, yeah, Adam, you probably have a little bit more experience in what exactly happened last week. Yeah, absolutely. So first off, frequently mentioned this on the show, but we'll mention it here as well. Microsoft 
is the employer for both Andy and myself. I'm a security specialist. Andy's a security technical specialist. So we are employed by Microsoft in our security business, um, which isn't directly related to this, but being a data privacy related incident, uh, we did have a lot of customers reach out about this. Now, number one, if you are a Microsoft customer, you can reach out to your account team and they do have some talking points that they can share with you. You should also look at your Microsoft 365 message center, because if you were impacted, you will receive a message in your message center with more details on the scope of your impact. Um, with that said, uh, do you want to emphasize just a couple of things, you know, to, to make sure you have the proper context for this? This was not a security breach. This was a data privacy incident, and I'm not, being pedantic with words, those are two different things. This was an endpoint that was misconfigured, essentially had not enough security to allow unauthenticated access, um, and that was later secured. So nothing was compromised or broken into or found like a security hole. It wasn't like that. The other thing is this, this was not related to any customer data in Microsoft's commercial clouds or government clouds or any other clouds like Microsoft 365 and Azure or Dynamics 365. So this did not allow access to your email or your SharePoint data or your Azure infrastructure or anything like that. This was really more of an internal Microsoft endpoint, like Andy said, from, from kind of the, the overall highlights for interactions between Microsoft and prospective customers and partners and all that. So customer data not impacted and that data was not able to be used to go compromise customer accounts or systems. Like there wasn't identity information or sign in information for your uh, customer environments as well. So not minimizing it, but do you want to clarify on what it is and what it is not? And just so we're, we're talking really clearly about that. Actually at the end of this week, um, some customers had originally received a message that Microsoft couldn't kind of further explain what ha exactly had been accessed. And for many customers, they received an updated message in their message center uh, near the end of this week, or maybe even over the weekend that can have more information now. So be sure to double check. If you originally were told that the exact items couldn't be provided, that may have now changed. And so part of the philosophy is when you have a data privacy incident, you don't want to have secondary and tertiary data privacy incidents. You don't want to have further exposure right? And so you want to be really cautious about making sure that you can link each bit of data to the customer it belongs to with confidence and then disclose that to them and only to them in an authenticated manner. And so in the Microsoft blog post on this, on the uh, MSRC blog, there, there was actually come some kind of pointed language aimed at SOC radar about this. Uh, number one, um, Microsoft felt like SOC Radar had kind of overcounted how many items were impacted because a lot of it was duplicative data and they weren't looking to do any sort of deduplication. The other thing, I didn't know this, Andy, until I saw the, the show notes that the search tool was taken down. Um, Microsoft did not like the search tool, not so much that it drew unattractive attention, but that the search tool itself was a data privacy concern. Andy, and you touched on this because it didn't require any sort of authentication to go search it. You didn't have to prove you belong to that organization to check if that organization was impacted. So you can think of really obvious examples and I'm making stuff up here just to be super clear, but you can think of obvious examples of competitors being able to check if the competitor was impacted. Like again, and I'm making stuff up, Home Depot could check if Lowe's was impacted and Lowe's could check if Home Depot was impacted or McDonald's could check if Burger King was impacted and so on like that. You as a customer shouldn't want other unauthenticated people to be able to check if you were involved in this. That's why Microsoft took a really conservative stance towards notifying only when it was extremely confident of that information and, and only communicating it directly through a secure channel, the M365 message center um, to global admins, or, or there's one other privileged role that could even read it. So most admin roles can't even read that message, or I think can't even see it unless they're, they're one of two roles. One's global admin. And I think it's like um, 
message center privacy reader or something like that's the other role. I'm getting the name wrong, but it's something like that. Um, was the only other role that could actually read that message as well. So, um, certainly a learning opportunity and, and do appreciate that sock radar did disclose this responsibly, did not post anything until Microsoft had the chance to remediate it. Um, sock radar informed Microsoft on September 24th, Microsoft notified, uh, customers who were impacted on October 4th. And this didn't really get picked up in the media. I'd say till like last week. So certainly that's appreciated that everything was able to be buttoned up and customers were able to be notified before it hit the public information. Although I think this also reveals many organizations don't have a strong enough handle on monitoring their M365 message center because most of them did find out about it for the first time from the media. And so if this is you, um, certainly an opportunity to get that more buttoned up. There are ways to send all your M365 message center messages to planner, which means like you can assign it as a task to a person and make sure that somebody is kind of signed off on every message that comes in. So you have coverage across the org. Like you can assign a planner, a task to your exchange admin, if it's an exchange online thing, and you can assign a planner task to your SharePoint online team, if it's a SharePoint thing and so on, that would be a really good idea to get stood up and utilize because it's a great way to make sure that the, the people who are responsible in your org have been notified are aware and have planned for that change, um, as, as a good process moving forward. So, you know, from anything like this comes opportunity to get better and certainly, um, you know, as I always say on the show, the goal is 100% secure code, 100% secure systems. That's not ever going to be a reality. And so sometimes the best thing to judge is not on never having a security incident or a data privacy incident, but how you respond to those things. So, you know, again, opportunity to do better, but also I think some of the reporting about this has been a little bit um, muddy. And hopefully we cleared a little bit of that up and we found some opportunities for your org to uh, be better prepared to handle the next one. Kind of piggybacking off of the message center, super important. It's honestly one of the most important places for your IT admins to be up on because you not only get messages like this, also service messages if there are you know, issues with exchange or teams, um, the service being down. Uh, but you also get information on features that are getting mm -hmm. uh, released. So a lot of customers come to me and Adam and they're like, there are just so many things like, where do we find out what is, you know, what are the new features? What is happening? And the message center actually has messages that come out with what's new in Intune this month or what's new in Defender for Endpoint. And then when you click on those messages, they actually will take you to documentation or blogs that have you know the write-up on what is actually getting released. And so um, very important that you do that. I remember getting woken up uh, for a call one time um, as a security uh, engineer and they were thinking that you know, something that I did um, took down the service and turns out it was M365 that was having an issue. Um, I also found out by looking at my Twitter, because that's normally where I check. Um, there's actually an M365 status uh, Twitter account that you can follow. Um, I have that set for notifications every time there's a tweet. And that's how I also get notified um, asynchronously from having to go into the admin portal. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, admin portal with the message center is very, very important. So, um, yeah, good call out there. Make sure you're, you're checking that. I just, the planner integration is just amazing. Um, as a way to manage that because it basically gives you a, a workflow engine for your message center and you don't have to stand anything up. There's like one button to click when you're in your message center. That's like sync to planner. And then from there, you just really need one person who's responsible. It's like a dispatcher to assign those messages as they come in to the responsible parties. And that shouldn't be a high volume task. That could be like a once a day thing, but just imagine if you get, you know, each one of those messages assigned to the responsible party and it's now a task that they have to sign off on and say, yep, 
I have read this message. I understand the change that's coming or I understand the impact and I'm good to go. Like, then you never get like, well, I didn't know about that. Nobody told me like, I actually, you signed off on this on, you know, Tuesday, the sixth, I can see you did it. That's, that's really helpful. So yeah. Uh, message center and, and just in general, um, and I know we got to move on, but as a former M365 system owner, it, it's just one of those things where you, you have to have that buy-in of like, I am going to stay on top of this. I am going to own this because there's a lot there. There's a lot of change and you will be a more successful admin when you are well on top of that. Uh, my co-owner and I back in the day when we ran the service, we, we weren't caught flat footed by anything. We knew when everything was coming, when everything was changing, when everything was getting turned on and we are never surprised. And so it's an opportunity if you want to be a great M365 system owner or technical owner um, to really be up to speed on that stuff. So there was another news um, Twitter rant, I guess, um, where I think Microsoft made another mistake, uh, honestly. And so uh, for a few years now, Microsoft's been telling customers that Windows Update automatically adds new software drivers to a block list um, if it's malicious or known to be malicious and it's designed to thwart um, a well-known uh, malware infection uh, playbook uh, play essentially and the technique is known as uh, bring your own vulnerable driver where an attacker once they get into the machine or have administrative controls they can then instead of having to write like a script or something like that, they can just install one of, uh, um, you know, many um, uh, third party drivers with known vulnerabilities. And, you know, those drivers um, can then, ex you know, be exploited by the attackers um, to gain access to, you know, the windows kernel or whatever uh, the driver has access to. And unfortunately um, it turns out that the windows update was not properly downloading and applying updates to the driver block list. And so that left users, both customers and, you know, Microsoft's own machines, the ones that I use um, vulnerable to these bring your own vulnerable driver attacks. And so, on the Twitter thread, um, went back and read the history. Um, someone from Microsoft product group uh, finally admitted that there was an issue and that they were fixing the issue with the servicing process, which prevented devices from receiving the updates to the policy. So Microsoft released a tool that allowed Windows 10 and 11 users to update the block list manually that has been held back for the last couple of years. It's a one-time update and we'll put the documentation in the show notes, but it is also getting patched on the next patch Tuesday. So uh, coming up shortly, the servicing process will be fixed. And so hopefully going forward, it'll automatically update with any of the vulnerable drivers that are out there. Not a lot to add here, obviously, <laughs> the thing that just surprises me about this is for all of the security researchers in the world and all of the people running windows, I'm just surprised this went on as long as it did. Um, obviously drivers are a really good exploit mechanism because they're signed cryptographically and they're trusted and they have access to very high privileged parts of the operating system. And so, of course, this makes like complete sense as a as a exploitation mechanism. And I'm just surprised nobody kind of noticed. Like, wait, wait a minute, this you know clunky old driver from insert vendor here uh, still will load, even though it's been superseded by several new versions now for a while. Um, anyhow, glad it's getting fixed. This will be a huge win for the security of the Windows operating system moving forward. So. The one good news is this rolls out on patch Tuesday. Probably one of the single most impactful security changes to the Windows operating system. And it's going to happen almost like a big bang, like very, very quickly. 
the entire footprint of Windows OS devices is going to get massively more secure. That's pretty cool. I mean, if you're trying to find the silver lining here, but um, just kind of surprising this went on as long as it did. Glad it's getting fixed. Um, yeah, we should have been fixed sooner, but here we are. And um, I guess if you're a listener and you have any input into patching, maybe that's a patch you will want to expedite and make sure it gets rolled out quickly as opposed to it gets held back in deployment rings for a very long time. Because you are all using deployment rings, right? Okay, so enough with the bad news. Let's talk about some of the fun stuff, which is Ignite happened a few weeks ago. Again, I know we're a couple weeks late, um, but you know, due to vacations and everything, we haven't recorded a live episode until tonight. And so we're going to talk about some of the things because there were a lot of announcements um and so we're going to link uh something called the book of news which is just a highlight of everything that was released from azure to teams to um infrastructure management security uh compliance all of that and it'll give you highlights on everything that was released we'll go over a couple of things that relate to security identity and endpoint management because that's mainly what we care about on this podcast um but there was a lot so if you're looking at you know azure infrastructure or ai or um biz apps anything like that i mean there were a lot of announcements Um, teams in general had a ton of announcements if you know you're into the collaboration space so um, definitely go back and take a look at the book of news. It gives you the highlights um, and links to a lot of the announcements um, that you can do a deep dive on. One of the things that was announced uh, was a new um, feature for Defender for Cloud called Defender for DevOps. And this solution will integrate um, into the the DevOps chain and that provides you more visibility if you have multiple DevOps environments um, to be able to centrally manage all of the security for DevOps, um, cloud configuration, in-code, uh, help remediate critical issues, in-code, multiple pipelines, multiple cloud environments, and um, platforms like GitHub and Azure DevOps are supported, and then other major DevOps platforms will be supported shortly. And so that's a welcome thing, um, especially for our coders out there, folks who are doing development, um, who have um, CICD pipelines that need to be secured. Um, so this will be something that you can um, integrate with Defender for Cloud. This is probably, from a lot of the security folks I talk to, one of their top concerns. And I'm sure Log4j contributed a lot to that. But it's top of mind is securing code, securing DevOps environments, and this helps with that. So I think this is um, interesting. I'm excited to learn more. And and like you said, Andy, initially support for GitHub and Azure DevOps, but other DevOps environments support to come as well. Um, and this can be complementary too, because there are technologies built into like GitHub, like GitHub Advanced Security, that does a really good job, for example, of like library management. Again, like Log4j, perfect example of that and the importance of something like that. So uh, a kind of a combined effort here to have that visibility as well as maybe code level visibility and combining all of those things uh, can really help bring confidence to your development platform. There was also another solution that was announced called Defender Cloud Security Posture Management. And... I know we've talked about this because Defender for Cloud is kind of part of that whole cloud security posture management, Mm -hmm. um, CSPM. And we announced a solution called that. And so this solution's in preview. uh, And I think it's going to build upon the things that are already a part of Defender for Cloud. And then it's going to include like the new thing, Defender for DevOps um, and other external attack services like our um, attacks, uh, external attack service management um, solution. And so I think taking all of that and then integrating it into one 
um, console that you can then see your cloud posture management secure score. You can look at um, all of your environments, uh, even if it's multi-cloud, like if it's AWS or GCP or Azure, and and take all of that information and have one platform for remediation, for alerts, um, and just for uh, plain um, situational awareness. And so that that's in preview now. Um, whether it's a rebrand, uh, you know, I, some people might say that, but I think it's taking what we already have and then adding more context to it um, so that you have more information, which is always good um, when it comes to security. This one, I will say, if you're a little confused, well, I was too, because Defender for Cloud, the free component to it, no no additional requ- no additional cost, is kind of a CSPM thing. So you can turn on Defender for Cloud at a at a fundamental level. I don't even know if you have to turn it on necessarily, but it will monitor things like your virtual machines and alert you again if they have like RDP ports exposed to the public internet or, or silly things like that. Um, SQL databases that are obviously misconfigured for access and, and those sorts of things. Again, like security posture, right? That's not going away and that's going to continue to be included. This is like, think of this as premium CSPM, like more capabilities and this will be a paid offering. So as you kind of think of the continuum of CSPM, Defender for Cloud will continue to have a built-in CSPM that's included. And then you'll have Defender CSPM, which is like a premium additional capabilities and feature set, which will be a paid offering. That's what was announced that's new is additional CSPM capabilities that will be, um, again, a, a paid offering. So very cool. Some additional stuff here, like the proactive attack path analysis. That sounds really cool. Um, predicting ways in, in which attackers can move laterally and being able to kind of cut that off at the knees. Very, very, very powerful. So looking forward to learning more about that myself. A lot of new things for endpoint management. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest things was a rebrand. <laughs> so I know our marketing people always have to have a job. And so they're always rebranding things. And, you know, Adam and I get a lot of flack from our customers mm-hmm. talking about how many times we rename things. And I think this is for the better because um, I think this is how I've referred to it for many years. Customers have referred to it for many years. And Microsoft, I think, just kind of gave up and we're like, we're going to go with this. So Microsoft Intune is the name of all of the endpoint management products going forward as far as, you know, for the cloud. Um, and then... Microsoft Configuration Manager is still part of that endpoint product, but it is still going to be called Configuration Manager. So no longer is there a Microsoft Endpoint Manager and Microsoft Configuration Endpoint Manager, um, Mecham and Mem and all that stuff. So it's just Intune, ConfigMan, just like it was before it was rebranded. And so I think that just makes it a lot easier and clearer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, one cool well, let me touch on the oh, rebrand real quick before you get into some of the new capabilities. So I, I think you've seen recently from Microsoft an effort to have these product families that map to like a, a, a paradigm. And, and I think overall, like you said, Andy, in the long term, if Microsoft sticks with this, I think it's a good exercise because Andy can now get on a call with a customer and he basically says, I cover anything that's Defender or Entra. Like that's pretty simple because Entra is everything identity, Defender is everything threat protection, Purview is everything compliance, Viva is everything employee engagement, Priva is everything privacy management, Intune is now everything endpoint management. So configuration manager is part of Intune from a product family perspective. I think the only part about this that gets confusing is Microsoft Intune is part of the Intune family. That sounds awkward to say, but past that, there's a whole bunch of new offerings coming that Andy's going to touch on here that are also part of the Intune family now. So Intune is the overall device management brand, Microsoft Configuration Manager, MCM, the new name, or just call it Config Man or or something. And if you say SCCM, we still know what you're talking about. Um, But 
Config Man is now part of the Intune family. So again, that'll be an adjustment like anything else, but I like all of these, these brands like Entra is just everything identity. I think that's much simpler moving forward. I think the only rebrand that's really left at this point, and I'm going to be anxious to see how this goes down, is going to be Azure Active Directory because it's like this very weird um, holdout at this point because it should be like Entra Directory or something. Um, so we'll see what happens with that because right now the way it's worded is Azure Active Directory is part of the Entra family. But anyhow, I don't mean to get on a tangent. We're talking about Intune. We're talking about endpoint management. What's new with Intune and endpoint management, Andy? Well, one of the things that piqued my interest as I was reading through all these different things is this Microsoft Tunnel, which if you're not familiar with Microsoft Tunnel, it's one of our you know, VPN solutions essentially for um, iOS and Android. And it's always been an application, that, like an app from the app store that you download and you have to configure as an admin, you have to configure the, the termination point for the VPN. But now there's a new feature that's being released in January for MAM, so mobile application management. And what's interesting about that is MAM does not require enrollment to Intune. So for certain, you know, Adam and I have had these conversations of, you know, should you just use MAM or should you use enrollment? And we have these good, better, best type scenarios. You know, MAM is just one of the ways that you can manage your data. And it's very lightweight. It just does it at the application later on the device. It doesn't require a full enrollment and configuration changes to somebody's you know personal device. And so it can be a good way to you know have some management, protect your data. And what this is is it allows now a VPN at the MAM level to you know get to wherever you need to, right? Like if I need a VPN connection for an application, an internal application um, to my corporate network, I could use it through MAM. Now, maybe from a security standpoint, you don't want that, but I can definitely see from a productivity standpoint or from a management standpoint, there may be use cases for this, like frontline workers or something like that, you know, to allow them to have um, access to a specific application. And it's basically... Um, almost like a per app VPN, uh, but you still have that management where you don't need a full Intune enrollment for the device. So really cool stuff there, I think. This is bringing feature parity with other uh, MDM solutions that have had this for a while. Um, Good actually had this all the way back in the day, like almost 10 years ago. Um and good was kind of like the first implementation of almost a MAM strategy where you didn't have to enroll your whole device. You just had the good app and then good app had like your mail context and calendars. Now the problem was you couldn't use native Apple mail. Um, you were relying on an email client from a company that's not an email vendor, not a productivity vendor. So it was kind of poor experience, um, but it was all in just one app, you know, and with sandboxing native to iOS, you basically had it pretty well contained, but what it also had was a built-in browser that could run over essentially kind of the good tunnel because good was architecturally similar to like blackberry or bez you know way back in the day um and that was interesting too because i remember i worked for at the time a financial services company that was like way way locked down um and yet with just the good app on an unmanaged device i could browse like the company intranet which is pretty cool and I imagine this implementation without knowing a lot of the implementation details, you know, sounds like it'll be similar where without even enrolling my device, I can have that tunneled experience to get to internal sites like an internal intranet or something. So that's interesting. And I think that's pretty cool. And um, I'm sure it'll be implemented in a, in a really uh, user friendly way where you can actually use a good browser like edge or something like that um, to do it. So I look forward to learning more about that. Endpoint privilege management is now in preview. Am and I talked about this on a previous show where we talked about all these different new things that were coming out. And we had alluded to privilege management as being one of those things that um, was possibly in the works, um, but it hadn't 
actually hit public preview yet, and now it has. And so what endpoint privilege management is, is um, it's a way to allow dynamic elevation of standard users to admin permissions for specific applications. And so like you don't give them admin rights to the machine, but you allow them to elevate, say, if they need you know, some CRM or something, right? They need admin rights for just this one application. You can have that elevate just for that one application. So um, pretty cool stuff. Um, it's going to launch at the same time as something called Microsoft Intune Suite. And what that is, it's going to be a premium suite that's, you know, an um, cost-effective way to include um, both privilege management uh, remote help, which has been out there, this Microsoft tunnel um, for MAM, um, as well as advanced, uh, advanced endpoint analytics capabilities. So that'll be part of this Microsoft Intune premium suite, which is uh, going to be at an additional cost, um, but you know, include a bunch of things that I think a lot of customers have been asking for and looking for. Um, if, if you want it all in one package, you can do that, or I think you can also just buy any of these specifically just one off a la carte. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's um just an interesting note there. This is this is not like a um this is not available yet. So this is expected to launch sometime next year, next calendar year I should clarify. Um but it'll be a new suite and and even the name isn't finalized. You called it the Intune Premium Suite, that's fine. Um or or like the advanced Intune Advanced Suite or whatever. Um, the name isn't finalized, going to launch early part of next calendar year. Um, haven't disclosed pricing or anything like that yet. Although if you ask your Microsoft account team, I believe they can disclose some like ballpark pricing with you under NDA. So you can ask for that if you, um, want to discuss that. Uh, but, but yeah, a a new suite of solutions that Andy kind of rattled all of them off. And I think we can't say what else is coming, Andy, um, publicly, but I think there's also one other component that can be discussed under NDA. Um, so there will be additional value coming as well. Um, won't be part of E5. So it's an additional thing above and beyond E5, uh, just to clarify there. But uh, kind of interesting because Intune has been around you know, for years and years now, moved to the Azure portal in 2017 or so. And so it's about six years old. It's gotten pretty darn mature at this point. And so this is kind of the next wave of capability for it, which I'm excited to see the Intune family grow and agree with you completely as somebody who came to Microsoft and originally the number one product I sold was Intune. It's near and dear to my heart. Seeing all of these things that customers have been asking out forever now a way for customers to get them. And again, integrated built into the platform, take advantage of our back roles already in place. I think there's really compelling stuff here. And if you already have like a remote help solution, like a BombGar or a let me in or, or whatever, um, you know, you could possibly consolidate vendors and consolidate costs, which a lot of orgs are looking to do right now uh, with the economic headwinds. So uh, definitely some interesting things there, but I just think interesting in the sense of going back to a mature product family and starting to really grow and expand it is very, very interesting. And just one last thing I'll say. On that note, and then I think we've got one more quick item to hit. Um, Configuration manager, part of the Intune family, does not mean it's going away, does not mean anything bad about it. It's a branding exercise only. Um, Co-management and configuration manager have a long future in front of them. In fact, although initially like co-management was positioned as a bridge technology, we've been telling customers now for years that it's a destination technology, and that's still the case. I can even say for MSIT and all of our internal Microsoft devices, they are co-managed. So just want to clarify that because it kind of popped in my head as we were talking like, oh, no, people might think with ConfigMan being consumed under the Intune brand that it means bad things for ConfigMan. And we kind of have to keep saying like, no, ConfigMan is healthy. It's going to continue. It's not going anywhere. So always good to kind of make that point again. And correct me if I'm wrong, you don't need to have E5 if you wanted to buy correct. any portion of this correct. premium suite or the premium suite itself. Correct. You could be on E3 and add just this. So it, it's, you know, you need to intune as a base somehow to add on to it, of course. But 
Um, it's and anyhow, I just E5 won't get you this, but you don't have to have E5 to get it either. So it's just a separate thing. Yep. And one final thing on endpoint management, uh, which I found again very interesting, is we finally um, have general availability for device based conditional access on Linux desktops. I'm going to say that one more time Linux, Linux desktops, not servers. And so this is something that I think a lot of people have been asking for, at least the you know the geeks within IT have been asking for, who may be using <laughs> Ubuntu desktop or something like that. Um, we now have device-based conditional access. So you can enroll your Linux desktop into Intune, and then you can apply conditional access policies to your M365 data through the Edge browser on Linux. So it does have to be through the Edge browser, um, but you can have device-based conditional access on Linux, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's been in the works for a while. There are more features coming for it. Um, they're going to get better uh, at uh, some of the compliance um, policies that are going to be out there, but um, the basics are there. So you, you can enroll and you can apply <coughs> um, some conditional access policies to it. Um, and then moving on to identity there's uh, a few things that um, were new in identity. One of them is this new, um, again, solution, product, whatever you want to call it, um, called Microsoft Entra Identity Governance, which is now going to be in preview. One of the things that I found within that that uh, was um, that piqued my interest was something called lifecycle workflows. Um, and so this is in preview now. Um, and what uh, lifecycle workflows are, it's a way to automate um, and manage uh, Azure AD users um, in three basic lifecycle processes. When uh, users join your organization, when they move in your organization, or when they leave um, your organization. And so there are certain things that you can do within the lifecycle management um, to uh, either assign them to groups or remove them from groups or whatever it is um, and, uh, and and automate that instead of having to manually do it. So pretty cool stuff. Um, I'll, I'll toss a link in the show notes, um, which talks about it, um, but that's in preview right now. Uh, Certificate-based authentication, also something that has been um, asked for for a long, long time. Um, one of the key ways for multi-factor authentication that meets the U.S. Executive Order on Cybersecurity that is now in preview as well, public preview. Um, it allows customers to adopt and easily deploy fish-resistant authentication um, with uh, improved user experience for identifying certificate authentication factors. And then finally, uh, one of the things that um, I thought was uh, awesome, I tested it this week, um, <laughs> called uh, conditional access authentication strings and adam is laughing because uh, when i tested it i accidentally locked myself out of my demo environment um, conveniently right before a customer demo um, so it definitely works mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah so conditional access authentication strings really really cool feature so if you go into your conditional access policies you'll now be able to see you can select multi-factor if you just want to do multi-factor but you could also say, instead of multi-factor, I want to spe specify the strength of that multi-factor. So I can make it passwordless or I can make it fish resistant. You know, I, I don't want to do just um, a text message or just a push notification. I want it to be um, higher on the strength level. And so um, you could do that per app, um, per user group, however you want to do it. Um, it's, it's a conditional access rule, right? So very, very flexible. Um, and, uh, that's in preview now. So definitely take a look at that. Um, but test it and don't do what I did, uh, and lock yourself out. Um, so though that's what, uh, I found was interesting in what's new for identity from, uh, Ignite. The identity governance also, by the way, has a bunch of on-premises connectors, and so this is kind of that continuing process of replacing the functionality that was in MIM or Microsoft Identity Manager before that Forefront Identity Manager. Again, not fully replaced and, and likely won't ever be um, 
completely replaced because honestly, some of that functionality might not be needed anymore, but moving more and more of that into Azure AD and there's more there in the identity governance and he hit on one item, which is lifecycle workflows, but there's more there. So you should check that out. Um, if you've been looking or waiting for some of that certificate based authentication, I know again, for anyone who has requirement to comply with that U S executive order on fish resistant authentication, this has been a long time coming. And for me, as someone who has kind of made ADFS my sworn enemy, and I'm trying to take out ADFS at every org I can, this was one of those things where when a customer would be like, we need certificate-based authentication, I would say, well, darn, you're, you still need to use ADFS because Azure AD doesn't natively support that. Well, now it does. Um, it's in preview now. I think we have a GA date in the near future for that. So that is phenomenal if you've been waiting anxiously to turn off your ADFS environment, you are now closer to that reality. And authentication strengths with conditional access, another one of those things customers have been asking for forever. Um, because as we've rolled out new technologies like FIDO2 support, passwordless support, CBA, customer's next question is, how can I enforce that? How can I make sure that that is the only choice to sign in with this? Having that as an option is great, but if somebody can, or an attacker can just fall back to, oh, send me a text message, you know, or whatever, well, you haven't delivered on that promise yet. And as I always point out, you have to have credible alternatives in place and they have to be deployed before you can get to this next step. And I think we've been on kind of a maturity journey with identity to get to this point. And there's still plenty of non-believers who still think like having to put in a code is more secure and we need to educate them on that too. But this is phenomenal. And yes, Andy, at least when it failed in your demo, it's not that it didn't work. It's that it did work and it locked you out. So that's at least if you're going to demo something to customers and have your demo not work the way you intend, um, having the thing work correctly and just lock you out is at least a better demo than oh, I expected this to happen and it didn't work. So it was still awesome. But this is really, really cool. We'll link to it in the show notes. But as an identity geek, identity, one of the first things I sold at Microsoft along with Intune, and I just mentioned that, um, I love seeing some of these because these have been a long time coming. I've been talking to customers for ages about the ability to enforce stronger authentication mechanisms uh, to access certain things. And I'm thrilled that this is here because this gets us one step closer to being able to eliminate passwords is even as an option. You know, people always get hung up on when we talk password this, they're like, well, I want to make it so that people can't put in their password. It's like, hold your horses. We'll get there, but we got to really dot our I's and cross our T's first. And ever since that came to Microsoft consumer accounts, um, gosh, was that a year ago now already? I've been anxious for that to come to Azure AD. And it seems like we're getting closer and closer and closer to that reality, which total side note if you haven't done this already, you can convert your Microsoft account, which you use for Xbox and Skype and your M365 consumer account. You can, in Hotmail or Outlook.com or whatever, you can now remove your password from that account so you don't even have a password. I did it. It's awesome. Highly recommended. And consequently, if you do that, you also don't have a password to log into your Windows machine if it's synced to that account. Mm -hmm. So like my Windows machine that is, has my MSA, mm -hmm. it just has Windows Hello. Mm -hmm. So it's a PIN or, or my biometrics and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a password to access it. There's no, nothing. Right. So I noticed, it's, okay, I'm glad you said that because I noticed that because I, um, I recently got a Surface Laptop 4 and it signed in with my MSA. And there's only two options on the Windows login screen, pin or face. And it's like, huh, password's not even an option. It didn't even occur to me. Well, obviously, I don't have a password for that account. So that's cool. Yep. Didn't even pick up on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so final topic is Windows. Um, there wasn't actually a whole lot on this particular uh, subject in the book of news. But if you missed it, this week there was a... Windows management, endpoint management, all things um, 
you know, Windows, Windows 365, um, Auto Patch, all of that, a technical airlift um, put on by the tech community group. Um, there were several days of uh, sessions. Um, so I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you're interested in going back and watching some of those. I was not able to watch all of them. Uh, there were quite a few um, uh, with me being sick. But one of the ones I did watch, which I felt uh, was a good one, was this new default hardening within uh, Windows 11 version 22H2. And they turned on this thing called LSAS protection. Um, by default, it is an audit mode for any versions of Windows 11 that's, that's getting upgraded to 22H2, but for any new deployments of 22H2 that have enterprise um, management or are joined, meaning that if you join it to AD, or um, Azure Active Directory or hybrid Azure Active Directory joined, and it has um, HVCI, which is a hypervisor protected code integrity, um, it, like the ability to have that, then it will actually get turned on by default. Um, and so, what LSAS protection is? It's it's kind of um, it's kind of part of like cred guard, but not exactly. It just protects the locals. Um, uh, it, it protects the LSAS process, which includes the um, uh, local security authenticator authority server service, which validates uh, users for local and remote sign-ins. But the additional protections that are getting turned on uh, prevent code injection that can compromise credentials into that um, LSAS process. So in order for an, um, an LSA plugin or driver to successfully load into this protected process after it's been turned on, it has to meet certain following criteria. Number one, it has to be digitally signed with a Microsoft certificate. And then two, it has to adhere to Microsoft security development uh, lifecycle process guidance. So even if it's digitally signed, if Microsoft finds that it, the plugin or driver is not following SDL guidance, it will not load it into the LSA um, service. And so, again, this is getting turned on by default for audit mode in all new upgrades to 22H2. And if you want to find out, I mean, first thing that I would do is to audit all the things that might be failing because any new deployment is going to have it turned on, you know, enforced, right? So, especially if you're an enterprise and you're AAD joining it or hybrid Azure AD joining it or domain joining it, it'll get turned on by default. So you can check your Windows events, 3065 and 3066, to see if anything is failing. Those are the events within the Windows event log that will show you if any of your plugins or drivers are going to get blocked from getting loaded into the LSA. Um, and so take a look at that, uh, make sure that you have that buttoned up. Um, but I think this is a good thing. You know, this is just one of those other things that, um, has been an option within windows. It's been there and now we're turning it on by default. Windows 11 for all the hoobaloob about its system requirements has really delivered on that security hardening promise. There's been a lot done with that because it can be assumed that it's running on TPM 2.0 and has all these different requirements met on it. It's eighth gen Intel Silicon or later on and on and on and on. So um, I like seeing this. <clears throat> I realize it's potentially impactful. However, just to summarize what Andy said, because he kind of went over it a couple different times. Again, this only impacts devices that are like domain joined or, or networked, you know, if this is a standalone Windows 11 PC, none of this is a concern, right? If it's like a home user. So this only affects enterprise environments anyway. If it's been upgraded, so if this came from the initial release of Windows 11 or it came from Windows 10, this is turned on in audit mode. So you'll see those audit events in the log uh, 3065, 3066. The only time this is enabled by default is if this is a fresh image straight to 22H2 on a machine that is domain joined, Azure AD joined, or hybrid Azure AD joined. So 
all of your devices that are already out there in the field, if they take the 22H2 update, this doesn't happen to them. Just to be clear, um, this would be like your images potentially, or not images, your devices on the bench that are getting image fresh to 22H2, they would be potentially impacted by this. But if you audit those events, you should know if you have an issue before you get to that point. You should have plenty of data points to collect, uh, assuming you've pushed 22H2 to at least some of your users by now. I would encourage you to take a look at the book of news and some of the other links that we're going to put in the show notes, because we touched on just a tad, you know, a little bit of the surface. Mm -hmm. Um, There was so much out there. I mean, honestly, I'm still trying to catch up. So Mm -hmm. these were the things that I picked up on that I thought our listeners would find useful, important, um, interesting. And, um, you know, but I encourage you to go out there and, and take a look there. Like I said, this week was the, airlift the technical airlift for the windows components in a couple of weeks there's actually going to be another technical airlift for the security compliance and identity stuff um so more to come and we'll talk about that um if there's anything that i find interesting from that which i'm sure there will be um but that's open i believe to the public because it's getting put on by the technical community um and so highly encourage you if you're um one of the uh, folks who are, you know, hands on keyboard, um, and doing this work every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, the technical airlifts are very, very good. It is not marketing fluff. It is, how do I do this? How do I implement this? Um, there was one session that I'm just going to call out cause I remember it. Um, the windows defender application control. We talked about that. If you go and watch the video, you'll see a guy actually go through the wizard tool and create actual policies for Windows Defender application control. Um, it's it's super in-depth technical. Take a look at that one. So um, really good stuff. Uh, and we'll have all the links. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching and listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or future topics you want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAWZERO and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.